Hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Now before I begin today, I would like to apologize to you all for the background. You may hear a lot of thunder and lightning and you know, probably even the rain. It's getting down over here. I mean, who knows? That might even make the chat a little better today. We'll see. But today's chat is going to be about the largest and worst election-related massacre of the 20th century. The Okoye massacre of 1920 now the massacre took place on november the 2nd and you know a couple of hours on november the 3rd of 1920 now some reports estimate only six african americans lost their lives during the massacre some reports state 25 to 30 african americans lost their lives and other reports estimate more than 80 african americans african-american lives were lost on this day now the truth is we may never know the actual number of lives lost but we will all know the true story of what happened during this fatal time after today's chat so with that being said let's chat okoy florida a town in Orange County, approximately 12 miles northwest of Orlando, Florida, is said to have been founded in the 1850s by a white man who brought along about 23 slaves with him. Now, many Confederate veterans, they settled in Okoye, Florida after the Civil War, and of course, they hired black laborers to work their lands. Now, I use the term hired very loosely, and I say that because African Americans were subject to black codes and Jim Crow laws at this time. Now, if you're familiar with black codes, I'm sorry, if you're not familiar with black codes and Jim Crow laws, please check out my recent video about Rosewood for more information. But um, African Americans were hired and supposedly independent workers at this time, yet they were still pretty much working like slaves. However, although the Jim Crow laws and black codes were dominating the South, surprisingly, by 1888, many of the black laborers were able to purchase land in Okoye, Florida. In fact, they purchased some of the very land that they had worked on over the years. And by the early 1900s, Black people were moving from Alabama, the Carolinas, and Georgia to take advantage of the opportunity to buy citrus groves in Orange County. Now, Okoy, Florida soon became a mixed community of black and white people. I mean, they weren't completely integrated and living in Kumbaya land and all of that, but they weren't completely segregated either. Now, there weren't any colored-only neighborhoods, and people pretty much lived as neighbors for many years. They lived as neighbors, but they still dealt with racial and political issues. I mean, that was pretty much just during this time period, anywhere. And around about 1918, after World War I ended, the black veterans, they returned home. And many of them, they returned home to Okoye, Florida. Now, when the war veterans returned home, they expected better treatment than they received before they left. I mean, they expected to at least be treated a little better than they had been treated in Europe. I mean, these men, they were war veterans, so of course they expected equal treatment, but, you know, they were in for a very rude awakening. The people of Okoye, Florida, they lived as neighbors, and the black people were allowed to buy some of the land. However, the white citizens, they were not here for the black citizens having equal rights, especially when it came to voting. In fact, they actually prided themselves on keeping the black people from the voting polls. Okoye, it was politically dominated by white conservative Democrats, and the black people at this time, they were mainly Republicans. So as I said earlier, the white people were not here for the black people having equal rights. Now, some white supremacist groups, such as the Ku Klux Klan or the KKK, they even resurfaced to ensure the black citizens remained oppressed and did not receive equal rights. And once the white supremacist groups began to resurface, racial violence erupted all over the United States. The violence became so bad, the events became known as the Red Summer of 1919. 
Now, to give you all a little info about the Red Summer of 1919, the Red Summer, it was a period in which white mobs went on lynching rampages throughout the United States. And many race wars or massacres took place. Now, I say that because if you're familiar with my previous videos, you will know that many massacres were played off as race wars before the truth came out and exposed that they were, in fact, massacres. But anyway, during the Red Summer of 1919, white supremacists terrorized almost 30 cities across the United States. And now that I filled you all in on the Red Summer of 1919, let's get back to the story. Now, although racial tension and white supremacy had gotten pretty bad throughout the United States, things hadn't gotten as bad in Okoye, Florida just yet. Now, things, they weren't all good and all that, but they hadn't hit rock bottom just yet. Now, by 1920, about one third of the population of Okoye, Florida was black. And some of the black residents, they were doing quite well for themselves. I mean, they were doing so well, they had land, they owned nice cars, and they were looking into the possibility of sending their children to college. Now, during this time, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, they actively registered black voters throughout Florida. And the white attorney and former judge running for U.S. Senate, Mr. John Cheney, he encouraged the black residents of Orange County to exercise their rights to vote as well. And not only did the NAACP and Mr. Cheney help the black people exercise their rights to vote, a prominent businessman who assisted the black community with brokering land deals by the name of Mr. July Perry, he also began registering black residents to vote as well. Now, we're going to come back to Mr. July Perry in a moment because he's one of the most important people in today's chat. But back to the story. Now, not only were black people fighting for voting rights, white women were also fighting for voting rights as well. So the tensions, they were extremely high this time. Now, the tensions, they were so high a month before the election. Attorney W.R. O'Neill and Judge John Cheney. I mean, remember, he was one of the ones encouraging the black people to vote. But the tensions, they were so high, they received a threatening letter from the KKK. So let's go ahead and read what that letter said. Okay. So the letter, it was um, the top. It says Orlando, Florida, September the... And I can't really see what that is. It's kind of dark right there, that number. So it was September the 20-something of 1920. And it says, Mr. W.R. O'Neill, city, sir, while stopping in your beautiful little city this week, I was informed that you are in the habit of going out among the Negroes of Orlando and delivering lectures, explaining to them just how to become citizens and how to assert their rights. If you are familiar with the history of the days of Reconstruction, which follow in the wake of the Civil War, you will recall that the Scalawags of the North and the Republicans of the South proceeded very much the same as you are proceeding. To instill into the Negro the idea of social equality. You will also remember that these things forced the loyal citizens of the South to organize clans of determined men. Who pledged themselves to maintain white supremacy and to safeguard our women and children. And I, if you are a scholar, you know that history repeats itself. And that he who resorts to your kind of game is handling edge tools. We shall always enjoy white supremacy in this country. And he who interferes must face the consequences. Grandmaster Florida. Ku Klux. Copy. Judge J.N.O.M. Cheney. You may accept this as a fitting message to you. Copy local Ku Klux. Watch these two. Okay. So that was the letter that they sent. And this letter, it was also sent to the white residents who help black residents register to vote as well. Now, before we continue, I want to fill you all in on an interesting fact about old wretched ass Florida. 
in my lovely tea voice. Yes, I am a tea sipper and I love me some tea, honey. But anyway, many don't know that during the Jim Crow era in the South, Florida had more lynchings per capita than any other state in the United States, except Mississippi. Now, y'all know Mississippi always been ruthless. Trust, we're going to talk about it in a video to come. But anyway, back to the story. Now, the KKK, they were not only sending threatening letters. They were also holding huge rallies to intimidate black voters and discourage labor organizers in the Orange County Groves and Turpentine Farms throughout many cities in Florida, such as Daytona, Jacksonville, and Orlando. Now, things began to get pretty bad in Okoy, Florida, as well, you know, around election time. And okay, so now we have, you know, went over our backstory about Okoy, Florida. So let's get into what we're really here for. The Okoy Massacre. Now, on November the 1st, 1920, the day before the election, the KKK paraded through two black communities in Okoy until the wee hours of the night. Now the clan was suited and booted in their robes. They had their crosses and torches and they were yelling on megaphones saying, and I quote, not a single Negro will be permitted to vote. And if any of them dared to do so, there will be dire consequences. Now, the Klan, they did all they could to scare and intimidate the black people. And once election day came, November the 2nd, 1920, some of the black citizens still gathered up the courage to try and vote. They did not let the Klan's intimidation stop them. And according to some reports, once the black citizens showed up to vote, they were not allowed to enter their respective polling places. Now, it's said that the white enforcers, they camped out around the polls to ensure they stopped any and all black citizens from voting. And the poll workers were said to have assisted them as well. So one by one, the black voters, they were turned away. Some were threatened and others, they were simply told that their names couldn't be found on the registration list. And ironically, the only person who could verify the black citizens were actually registered to vote was Mr. R.C. Bigelow. And Mr. R.C. Bigelow, he was unable to be located because he was out on a fishing trip. So many of the black voters, they accepted defeat and they just returned to their homes without voting. And they pretty much really had no choice. Now, some reports state that some black citizens, they were able to vote with no problem at the polls during the early morning hours. And they really didn't encounter any issues until later on in the afternoon. Now, regardless of how the reports tell the events prior to the massacre, the reports, they're very clear when it comes to the brave and determined black man named Moses Norman. Now, Mr. Norman, he was determined to vote. He was so determined, he refused to be intimidated and he refused to give up. And when Mr. Norman, he showed up at the voting polls in the afternoon, he was turned away. Now, Norman, he was told that he hadn't paid his dollar poll tax. Yes, you heard me. I said dollar, one dollar poll tax. And when Norman was turned away, he went to Orlando to seek the help of Mr. Cheney. Now, before Norman was torn, turned away, he did argue that he had paid his dollar poll tax, but his argument pretty much fell on deaf ears. So um, he went ahead and just went and talked to Mr. Cheney about what was going on. Now, Mr. Cheney, he encouraged Norman to try again. And Norman, of course, he went back and he did try to vote again. But poor Norman was turned away yet again. Now, it's still very unclear as to why. But for some reason, Norman's determination and will to be equal in vote was the match that lit the inferno, which burned black Okoy to the ground. Now, after Norman was turned away for, from the polls for the final time, a mob of over 200 white men decided to hunt him down and teach him a lesson, according to the reports. 
Now, some reports say the mob caught up to Norman initially and shots were fired, but Norman managed to escape. And after Norman escaped, the white mob, they got wind of Norman hiding out at a friend's house named Mr. July Perry. Remember, I told y'all earlier, we was going to talk about him a little more. Now, the white mob, they surrounded the Perry home before rushing into the home, hoping to capture Norman. Now, Perry, he had a family. So, of course, he stood up and protected his home. And, you know, during all of the commotion, two of the white mob members lost their lives. And Perry was arrested. Now, some reports state that Perry was suffering from a gunshot wound to the leg as well. And not long after Perry was taken to the jail, an angry white mob broke in. They overpowered the jailer and they took Perry. And according to the reports, after Perry was pulled from his cell, he was tied to a car and drugged before being hung and filled with bullet holes. Now, Perry was brutally lynched, and his remains were said to have been hung on a telephone pole in public view near Mr. Cheney's home. And oh no, the violence hadn't stopped with Perry, of course. I mean, after Perry's life was taken, the angry white mob turned on the black community of Okoy, Florida. The mobs began terrorizing the black citizens within the town. They went on a lynching rampage and they also decided to burn the town down. I mean, of course, we know this is their M.O. They burned down all of the black homes, churches and much more. And of course, the Perry home was the first one to go up in flames. Now, the African-American businesses, homes and churches burned like an inferno. And any surviving black residents were forced to flee. And many of the fleeing black residents, they lost their lives to bullets of the white mob as well. Now, the lucky, the lucky few black people who did manage to escape to safety, they were too horrified to return home after the massacre. And of nearly 300 black residents who lived in Okoy, Florida, no more than two black residents remained after the massacre. And from the 1930s to the 1970s, not one black person lived in Okoye, Florida. And after the massacre of 1920, the newspapers, they began reporting that you know, order was restored in Okoye and everyone should just stop talking about the massacre and pretty much just shut up. I mean, however... The NAACP, they did try to get justice for the people of Okoy, you know, the people who lost their lives during the massacre, and they actually investigated the massacre. They sent in their executive director, Mr. Walter White. Now, Mr. White, he was said to have been a black man who could pass as a white man during this time. And during Mr. White's visit to Okoy, he discovered local whites still giddy with victory. And Mr. White, he reported 30 deaths in his final report. Now, the locals, they were saying are bragging about 56 black people being killed. And other sources say 80 or more black people lost their lives during the massacre. Now, it's said that the number of people that lost their lives is so unclear because many of the black people were buried in mass graves. And this was common during many of the massacres that you know, took place over periods in history. And in 1921, the NAACP and other civil rights organizations, they called on the House Election Committee of the U.S. Congress to investigate the massacre and black voter suppression in Florida. However, of course, the Congress failed to act. So, of course, nothing was ever done about the massacre, as with many of the other massacres. And we all know that, you know, they quickly put up a historical marker. So a historical marker was put up honoring Mr. July Perry and others who lost their lives in the massacre. And this marker, it was placed in Heritage Square outside Orange County Regional History Center on June the 21st, 2019. Well, 
that brings us to the end of today's chat. But tell me what you all think. Do you all think if Norman had given up on Bowden and not been so determined, the massacre would have never occurred? Or do you think the massacre was inevitable and bound to happen regardless if Norman showed up or not? I mean, tell me what you all think about the story all together. Um, drop your thoughts in the comments below. Please like the video. Please share the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. If you would like to support the channel in a monetary way, the information will be in the description of the video. And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.